Short and sweet. Can you turn the lights on here? Or something? You want lights on? Could you open the shutter up? Okay. Yes, we can. You want me to open this shutter? <laughs> you want this shutter open? That's what he was saying. Okay, got it. Are we beginning? No, wait a second. We need to get some light on the subject here. Because I got the light in the car, but I didn't want to blast it away too much. Oh, let's do this. Works? That works. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Well, welcome everyone to Kelly House and Sunday Afternoon With. Um, this is a program today that's in conjunction with our exhibit on immigration. And we are absolutely delighted to have with us Dr. Almana Costa, who is a professor of uh, teacher education, I'm actually in education at California State University in Stanislaus and also the director of Portuguese studies there. And he has been there, or a professor there <coughs> since 1995 and came to America when he was 10 years old with his parents. You got amazing memory. And, uh, <laughs> settled in the valley. Mm -hmm. And I, you lived here in California? 50 years as of May 28th. My goodness me. So uh, today the title is Hooked to America, mm -hmm. the Impact of Whaling on Portuguese immigration. And uh, his family did come from the Azores. I mm -hmm. neglected to say that. So we are eager to hear more about whaling and the big picture of how it impacted us even here in Mendocino. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. So, I'm uh, so glad to be here. This is only my second trip of 50 years in California. Only the second trip up to this part of the state, you know. It's amazing how we uh, we tend to think it's Bay Area and L.A. and San Diego, and uh, we forget half of California is north of San Francisco. And beautiful country, I tell you. You guys gave me the best weather, and I've had <laughs> the warmest hospitality at uh, at what is a brewery gulch in yeah. wonderful place. If you haven't been there, I recommend that you go there. It's, uh, it's been an interesting uh, thing. I, you know, my family came to America when I was 10 years old. Literally, my brothers and I got together on May 28th to celebrate our 50th year of arrival in this country. And I've always wondered, you know, how is it that from most, first of all, most uh, immigrants from Portugal actually come from the Azor Islands. And I uh, wonder, how is it from a little place in the middle of the Atlantic did people find their way to California. And I've wondered about those things and uh, and so over my lifetime I've spent a lot of time delving into this and yeah, trying to understand. Could you set back for there because you're in Britain. Go ahead. <coughs> no problem. You know that there is, um, and this is literally true, if all the people of Azorian descent went back to the Azores we would not all fit on the island. <laughs> I mean, there are mo far more. I think Ireland could say the same, whereas there are 50 million Americans claim to be Irish uh, descendant. So there are two very distinct periods of immigration for Portuguese Americans. One is uh, before, the, before World War II, essentially, before the Great Depression, and peaking in 1911 through 1920. Although, interestingly enough, and in fact, looking through some of the things in this museum, the Lemus Room back here, a lot of Portuguese were here in Mendocino way back to the 1850s. You know, so there were people coming here very early, but the peak seemed to fall here. And then, you know what happened in 1939? Great Depression and all that. But what many people don't realize is the National Origins Act. Uh, any historians in the audience? Any know what I'm talking about? Okay, basically the National Origins Act said that you could only be admitted to the United States in proportion from countries around the world in proportion to the number of people of that ethnicity who were already here. Okay, so basically many people historically interpreted to mean that we were trying to keep the United States as English, Irish, and German 
and really a reaction to the southern Europeans, to the Italians and those others, and to the East Europeans, the, the Polish and those others, trying to, to be exclusive in who we were admitting. Well, because the Portuguese had so few people here, it really almost stopped Portuguese immigration. So you have both the National Origins Act and, of course, the Great Depression and World War II, which both put an end to it. And then, so you have, after World War II, still very few people coming. And then there was a very unlucky, very lucky event in the Azores. An earthquake erupted. And it was unlucky for the Azorians who were living there, but it was lucky because Senator John Kennedy, later known as President Kennedy, decided that if, because he was senator from Massachusetts, where you'll see later how this politically played out for him. The thing is, he introduced a bill that became law that allowed Azorians to be considered refugees because of the volcano. And they were supposed to be people from the island of Fayal, one of the nine islands in the Azores. And as people say, Fayal never had so many citizens <laughs> because all of a sudden every Azorian was a resident of Fayal trying to get a ticket to the United States. And as a consequence, you saw immigration start to go up. That was 1958. So really around the 1960, 61, it really picked up. And then the United States changed its immigration law again and basically said that now the main point of the law was trying to reunite families. So if you had a sibling live in the United States, if you had a parent, if you had a child, they could petition to reunite their families here. Well, here's an interesting thing about the Azores. There is not a family. I guarantee you there is not a family in the Azores that does not have relatives living in the United States. Okay? And so all of a sudden, the gates flooded open. And this happens to be the time when my family came. My wife, Albertina, is sitting here. And her family came at the same time in the 1960s. I actually could have come long before that. I didn't realize it at the time. My mother was born in Gustine, California. OK? Does anyone even know where Gustine is? <laughs> oh, you do. <laughs> Okay, okay. So, because my mother was born in Gustine, at the time of birth, I and Ted Cruz can claim the same thing. I could have run for president. <laughs> um, my, because I was a child of a U.S. citizen, I was a U.S. citizen by birth. I didn't realize that my, my mother didn't register me with the U.S. consulate so until we immigrated. But she could bring her family at any time. It, there were other factors. We'll talk about why she didn't bring us back here sooner or didn't bring us here at all. But anyway, so you see a second wave of immigration peaking in the 70s. And then after that, it went down. And quite frankly, nowadays, hardly anybody immigrates anymore. Why? We'll talk about it in a little bit later. But things got so much better. And as, um, in fact, I saw here one of the displays that was here yesterday. They talked about the pool. What is the pull? But besides the pull, there's a push also. And I have, in fact, a slide that will talk about what was pushing people out. I, I sometimes think the great metaphor for the Azorians is the lemmings. The myth, which is not true anymore, scientists have disproven it, but the myth was when there was too many lemmings, they would all throw themselves at the sea and go out in other places. Well, the Azorians are like that. We tend to peak have too many people, too many babies. We can't all live on small islands with limited resources. We immigrate in massive waves. And then after it's, we've loosened up, there's not so many left, nobody immigrates. Well, now Europeans, as you know, aren't having babies anymore. I think it's one child, literally, one child per couple is the, the average anymore in Europe. So there's a declining population as it is. So two distinct waves, actually Mendocino, and Northern California is mostly descendants from this wave. Very few people from the second wave came here. They mostly went to the East Coast and they went to where we are in California and other places <coughs> south. So where in the heck is the Azores? Well, see this right here? Nine islands. 
The Azores have a very interesting, any, do we have any geologists in the audience? Okay, because you could talk about this better than I could. The Azores actually sit where three tectonic plates come together. There's the African plate, the European plate, and you can barely see here the mid-Atlantic range where the North American and the European and African plates are pulling apart, literally pulling apart. So there are islands here that literally sit on the middle of that fissure. They're long and thin, and they literally have part of the island in one of the plates, part of the island on another plate. So what does that mean? Earthquakes, volcanoes, and all of those things that come about. I'm going to point out a couple other set of islands to you just because later in some other things they will be referenced. This happens to be the Cape Verde Islands. They were uninhabited until the Portuguese quote unquote <coughs> discovered them. I think in this case we can <coughs> say they discovered them in the 1400s. And they're important because a lot of people from Cape Verde also came to um, America on the whaling ships. So you've got Azorians, you've got Cape Verdeans. The Cape Verdeans are, there was no one there, Portuguese settled it, they interbred between Europeans and, and Africans, and so you have a mixed, very mixed, mixed race uh, people, Portuguese speaking though, uh, in, and, and one of the few democracies in Africa. I mean, they literally, uh, they've been able to. And there's another uh, set of islands here that you'll see some reference to later, the Madeira Islands. At one point in the Canaries, in case you've heard are right here. So that's the Azores. Actually, there are three groups of islands in the Azores. The eastern, the central group right here, which is five, two in the east, and two more over here. These two that sit out here are actually where a lot of the people from this area came from. The island of Flores, Flowers. Okay? They, a, a lot of people here in north trace their origins to this island. Where we live, and in most of other California, they trace their origins to the central group. In the east coast, most of them trace their origins, origins to this east, uh, eastern group of, uh, of the islands. Um, I've read, and I, I'd actually need to go back on the map and look at it, but I've read that this island is actually closer to Canada than it is to mainland Portugal. Okay? So Newfoundland in Canada. It doesn't look like on the wall map, but if you look on the globe, you'll see that it is actually quite close. We fly here almost every summer. It's four and a half hours out of Boston. So it takes us longer to get to Boston than it does from Boston <laughs> to the Azores. So this is one of the islands, and you can see a typical of a lot of the Azorean islands, not all of them, but long, multiple volcanoes. You can see one of the volcanoes here. This is the island of San Miguel or St. Michael, if you go with the translated name. So the Azores were settled or discovered in, in late early 1400s. They began settling them through the 14s and 1500s. And by the 1700s, like the Limmings, we had overpopulated the islands. And so it was time to start going. And at that point, they went to Brazil because it was a Portuguese colony. And if you know anything about Brazilian history, the Spanish were coming up from Argentina. Portugal was trying to stop them from coming into what they considered Brazilian territory. And they took Azorians and literally started colonies uh, along that as a way to claim the territory from uh, Brazil. But by the early 1800s, America became the preferred point of destination. And I think a much better choice, quite frankly. You know, there were so much more opportunities here, and they won't get the Zika virus, you know. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, this became the... Uh, the place that we're going to get into some details. And in the 1950s, Canada became a major destination as well. So went a little too far. So a couple of uh, ideas of what the Azores Islands are. I actually decided to pick on where we spent some time. I was actually, you can barely see it, but there's a little white spot there. That's where I was born and raised. <laughs> Literally born in the front bedroom of the house there. Uh, this happens to be Albertina's family home. So we split our time between both of the islands. People go to Hawaii and they say they're beautiful. I think I've gone to Hawaii three times. I love Hawaii, but I think beauty-wise, it's about, I don't know who has the better. Hawaii has a warmer climate, I will yeah. tell you that. A okay, water. yeah, a warmer water for sure. So where do the Portuguese come to? California mm -hmm. is the first place. Not a whole lot of us 
mean, 356,000 is not to like we're a huge population. And then Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And these three islands are actually where the majority <coughs> of people from the Azores came from. The other three states, New, uh, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, tend to be more of a later immigration after World War II and more people from uh, main mainland Portugal and not so much from the Azores. Although there's a, a mixing, and yesterday I was talking here to, is it Rex, I think, yeah. Smith, Rex right? Smith. Yeah. And we wound up speaking for a long time, and he was telling me that there were two Portuguese settlements here. The Azorians were down there and the mainlanders were up here, okay? So any of you trace your roots to either there or there, okay? And could you date each other? That's the question. <laughs> I. <laughs> Were busy dating the Finns. Oh, they were? Okay. So, well, we needed that for taller genes, you know? So, <laughs> okay. Um, so, in California, you can see that there are Azorians all over the place, but the main, this being pure numbers by Alameda County, basically across from San Francisco. And in fact, if you read John, John Steinbeck, there is in one character in one of the books that's Portuguese Joe, I think, mm -hmm. is the, the name, you know, and you will see some references to the Portuguese in Oakland, uh, San Leandro, that area. And in fact, there's a book here from one of the Portuguese fraternal organizations, and all the fraternal organizations, there were seven of them in, the port, in, uh, in Portuguese communities, and um, they were all based in somewhere in the San Leandro, San Jose area because that was the, the biggest concentration. But you can see a lot of these other ones, Santa Clara is San Jose, Stanislaus is where we're from, right in the, in the middle LA, Contra Costa back to the Bay Area, Sacramento, and pretty well mixed in. But because we're small numbers, as far as a percentage, the highest percentage we have is a little over 6% of the population, and that's in Merced County. Everywhere else, you start getting smaller and smaller. Let me just move this just a little bit. <coughs> it's a little bit off the screen. Okay, there we go. So no, nowhere do you have a huge concentration. Yet in some places, there's, it's significant enough that people know. I, uh, when I was going to junior college, there was a poster up on the wall, uh, and they were teaching Modesto Junior College. They were teaching Portuguese, and they... And the poster was kind of cute because it said Portuguese, the official language, and they ticked off the countries. Brazil, Portugal, Angola, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, Cape Verde, et cetera, et cetera, and Gustine, California. <laughs> 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 so is that true? <laughs> I spent so little time there, um, unfortunately, that okay. I came to Hollister and Gustine. Yeah. Okay. So it's, uh, at one point, I think it was true. It was, Gustine was a very Portuguese town. Now it's, I think, more Latino. But again, you know, you can see small. But there's, there's something that you will see later. Merced, Kings County, which is down in Tulare, Stanislaus County, Modesto, that area. A lot of these areas have Portuguese-American congressmen. There's three congressmen from the valley. And they... You can see where, why, in the sense, because there's more of a concentration, and there's also economics, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, so, as I was saying earlier, there has to be, there's two causes to immigration. One is there has to be a push. N people don't necessarily leave unless there's a need to leave, okay? And so there has to be some economic, some political upheaval, something that leads people to look for a better place to go. And then at the other end, there has to be a pull. They will go where they will find jobs. And for the Portuguese, for the Azorians, it was first the whaling industry, and then it was textiles. If you've been to southeastern Massachusetts, it was the cotton mill that everyone dressed from cotton cloth made in southeastern Massachusetts. And so that's where we're going. So to understand the push a little bit, let me take you just very quickly through a lot of years of Portuguese history. And I, I just read actually about a month ago that Portugal celebrated 822 years of existence. Okay, because it was, and they, they traced it back to the year that the Pope recognized Portugal as an independent country. Because in those days, in the 1100s, if the Pope didn't recognize you, 
you didn't exist, you know. Mm -hmm. And he f had a papal document saying, you know, it's an independent country, we recognize it. But in the 14 and 1500s, and American history, this is where I really don't think American history uh, really gives us, we, we don't learn about the Portuguese, we learn about the Spanish. <laughs> and because the Spanish had more impact in the Americas. But in the 1400s, Portugal was the seafaring nation. They were the ones that were literally sending every year boats to go a few miles down the coast of Africa and to trying to find the route around Africa to India. It wasn't until 1500s that the early uh, 1498 act, no, 1498 was Columbus, 15, that Vasco da Gama was able to go around and actually get to India doing that. But Portugal controlled the seas. They controlled the Indian Ocean. They took ships to India. They took ships to Japan, to China. And it was the golden age of Portugal, too much to the mod detriment of modern Portugal, because I think we still live a little bit in the past. We keep thinking of what we did back then, where I think it would be a lot better if we looked ahead to what we need to do economically. But in the, the funny thing of uh, the day, age of kings and divine right of kings, what, what did you do when you had no king, when there was no male heir? We know what Henry VIII did. Kept chopping off heads and marrying <coughs> women, okay? Because he wanted a male heir. Well, in 1500s, Portugal ran out of male heirs. And so what could they do? The closest heir happened to be the king of Spain. And so by the fact that there was no descendant to the Portuguese crown, the heir was the king of Spain, and you could inherit a whole country, and he did. Wow. And so now, 1580, we become part of Spain. And the interesting thing in the, in the island I'm from, in the Azores, we have a huge fort, huge military fort, not built by the Portuguese, built by the Spanish under Philip II of Spain. Why? Because now that the Azores were part of Spain, all the ships leaving the Americas loaded with gold would stop in the Azores. And they had this huge fortification to protect the ships in the harbor from being attacked by pirates because just out at sea were the British and the French and everybody else trying to get a hold of that gold. Okay. Can I ask a question? You this bet. Is, this is going to show my ignorance, but if you look at a map of Spain, Portugal looks like it was an inset, an afterthought. Uh, I don't know any more than what I see on the map. Yeah. Can you explain that briefly? You know, it's interesting because I have actually read a book on that by a, a guy named Charles Boxer, historian, and he said there is no logical explanation for the existence of Portugal as an independent country. Because the Spanish were able, under Ferdinand and, and um, Isabella, they were able to unite the two big kingdoms, Aragon and Castile, into what became Spain. And Portugal kind of stood out as a little thing to the side. And I think really the only explanation why they survived independently was that the British and the Spanish never liked each other. So the British always tried to side with the Portuguese to keep them as a needle in the side of Spain. Or because militarily we could not stand up to uh, to Spain. So a little okay. bit like the creation of Israel. Le yeah, <laughs> except we we were all Catholics in the Iberian Peninsula, but <laughs> nevertheless we didn't get along, you know. And I, as a small child studying history in Portugal, there was only one history in Portugal. We fought the Spanish, we beat them back. <laughs> I mean, that's a constant story again and again. And remember, history is written by the victors. Yeah. And in Portuguese schools, we're, we study the, our version of history. The, the story goes, though, that there was a, the, um, what is now Portugal in the northern part. There was a, uh, a count from Burgundy in France who married <laughs> the daughter of the king of, at that time, Cas Leon and Castile, so that part of Spain. And it was a county within that reign. And he rebelled and decided to declare independence. And the king was too busy fighting the Moors and trying to reconquer southern Spain that he didn't bother. And by the time he took notice of it, it was too late to reconquer it. And so it became an independent country. So how did the language uh, differ? Now, the language is uh, Portuguese is a different language. from. Mm -hmm. Remember, Spain actually has four languages. In Spain, there is no Spanish, okay? Mm -hmm. 
In Spain, there is no Spanish. In Spain, there's Galician, there is Castilian, there is Catalan, and there's Basque. Okay? Uh, Castilian is what in the New World became known as Spanish. So what you hear Mexican speak, what you hear Central American speak, it's Castilian Spanish. And, but Portuguese, Gal Galician, which was a, that north of Portugal, and that strip along the coast all spoke Galician Portuguese, what linguists now call Galeco Portuguese. They lumped the two together. I've actually, you know, in fact, in Portugal, they run a channel from northern Spain, from Galician. And the, the languages are, to this day are almost identical. They're not quite anymore. The Galicians tend to, they've developed a little bit of a lisp over the years, a la Castilian, where we don't have that lisp as much, but it's almost identical to this day. So that's how we came. So we have Spanish domination. Now the whole of Europe is against us because we're with Spain. And remember, this is Charles V. I, know, I don't want to give too much history, but he was at war with all of Europe, trying to conquer all of Europe. And we're part of, so they start attacking. They start taking over Portuguese colonies, the English, the Dutch, everybody throughout the world. So Portugal entered into a period of decline. They regained their independence in 1640. They actually took over Brazil again because the Dutch had taken it over. They reclaimed Brazil, but they did, were not ever able to claim their, the trade routes to India and to Asia. And the Dutch now had control of those. Later, the British took it over from them. So anyway, we end up then with a period of decline. And then in the 1800s, that really continued. In early 1800s, not Napoleon directly, but his forces under a general actually invaded Spain and then invaded Portugal. At that point, uh, the British were out at sea. They literally stuck the Portuguese king in a boat, took him to Brazil. And Portugal has the distinction of being the only European country that was governed from one of its colonies. Okay? Because once they got to Brazil in Rio de Janeiro, they never wanted to go back to Portugal. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, even after Napoleon was defeated and sent out to the middle of the Atlantic, the king <coughs> stayed in Brazil. <coughs> so eventually, one of the children went back after Brazil became independent, reclaimed the throne. But then Portugal went through a civil war. Almost the time the United States was going through a civil war, Portugal was going through a civil war. And in this case, the war was about those who wanted to try to reestablish an absolute monarch, meaning one had complete authority and they didn't share it, and one that those that were trying to establish what was called a constitutional monarchy. So basically now having a parliament to kind of control a little bit of the of what the kings could do. Well, after the Civil War, and that lasted for quite a while, there was also a strong Republican movement that said, why no king at all? And so what happened was, in 1908, they literally blew up the king and his oldest son in Lisbon as they, as they were going through. They shot him dead, and the youngest son became king but only lasted two years, and then he ran off to England, and the country became a republic. But the rebels had a hard time governing. It's one thing to blow things up. It's another thing to become the government. And what happened in the 18 years there was, and this is my term, but literally we had the president of the month. We had presidents that lasted weeks. They were shot and killed. We had others that lasted a year or two, were deposed, were killed. And so the country literally went to hell in those 18 years, fell apart, e total economic collapse. And what happened is the military stepped in. As happened in so many places when times are desperate, the military stepped in, established the dictatorship. They brought in a guy named Antonio Salazar, who was an economist from the, the University of Coimbra, and asked him to try to get the country economically straightened, that, straightened out. He liked being in power and stayed on until he died in 1968. Wow. Okay? Uh, and so he controlled, sorry, he controlled the country from behind, where am I? Uh, he controlled the country from, uh, from behind the scenes. 
um, and made, I think, what was one fatal flaw that led to the second wave of immigration more than anything else. Portugal had extensive colonies in Africa, Angola, Mozambique, so mostly in southern Africa, but others. And they decided that even though the French and the British pulled out and gave independence, they were going to hold on. They were going to keep their colonies. Well, everyone was drafted to four years of military service. And my family personally, four boys. So for my mother, that was a huge impetus. I'm getting my sons out of here before they have to go out to Africa. And so when my brother turned 17, it was either go now or he's going to get drafted. And that's the year that she said, we're going to America. And we packed our bags and went. But then what happened in 74 is they finally overthrew the dictatorship, gave the colonies their independence. And so that changed. Portugal joined the European Union and everything got better. So let's now talk about how whaling became such a big part. There's a, a very nice, I have not been there, although I've talked to the several times and had some of the traveling exhibits come to Turlock, the New Bedford Whaling Museum. In fact, it might be interesting if, for you guys here to be in touch with them because they've got some interesting traveling things that come through and they would, would probably gladly bring them here. So from uh, some of their research, and I'll, you guys can all read, so let me give you 30 seconds to quickly read that because I think you can do that quicker than I can. Okay, so we were, we still are, just like the California coast has a lot of whales, the Azores sit in the middle. National Geographic says it's the best place to watch whales in the world, is the Azores. And whale watching is now big time tourism, it go toward that. So the ships were mostly going out of Martha's Vineyard and New Bedford and going out to the Atlantic you know, and it becomes so well known that Herman Melville, in chapter 27 of Moby Dick, and again, I'll let you read. So did the Azores have a whaling industry of their own before it started? No. They didn't. In fact, uh, there is an interesting thing in the Azores. The vocabulary we use for whaling is English. We literally talk about the, the small boats that they take out to hunt the whales. We call them literally a boat, which is not a Portuguese word. We've, we've Portuguesized it. We spell it B-O-T-E, you know, because that's for us what makes it the English. But we learn from the Americans how to hunt whales. In the late 1700s, early 1800s, this literally meant these long boats that looked almost like canoes, rowing them out into the, you know, out there where the, the, when the whales were spotted, and they literally had spotting stations throughout the islands on the shores, and they had them with these rockets. They would, if they saw a whale, they would shoot up a rocket, and all the men in the village would head toward the port. They'd get on these boats, they would row as fast as they could, because hunting a whale in those days was close-up work. You literally had to be close enough to harpoon <coughs> the, wheel, the whale <coughs> from where you were at. And many people think you killed them by that harpoon, but you didn't. What you did is then you let the whale would drag you around for hours, and the whale died of exhaustion more than anything else. Until the whale was so exhausted, they could get up close again, and then they could lance it multiple times. And so you would be out at sea hours and hours and hours being dragged around. But Herman, uh, Herman Melville knew this. Of course, we know, you know that he really knew about whaling, and he's referring to here. So when you think about it, the first history we know, 1752, before we are an independent country, there was already Portuguese, and I suspect he was a Jew because Portugal, I think if you know a little bit of Portugal and Spain, Portugal and Spain decided to expel all Jewish people in the fi late 1500s during the Inquisition, and they, uh, they went out. Most of them went to, uh, to um, the Holland, 
but they also came to the Americas. In, first, in fact, the first Jewish synagogue that we have history, the Toro Synagogue in uh, Newport, Rhode Island, was established by Portuguese Jews who were kicked out of the country. Okay, uh, So interesting thing. And then you have in Martha's Vineyard as well, 1760s, you have Portuguese with the Americanized version of their names, but you have people already owning boats, getting involved in the whale business. And so really as you pick up in the years, you start to see that the records of the ships, 700 Portuguese sailed out of New Bedford ports on whaling ships in around that time. So you, you've got a lot of people. Uh, August 1834, 25 sh 21 ships were docked on Fayal Island, and most of these were American whaling ships. As um, you guys probably know, whale oil was how we lit America in the 1700s. Okay? What killed whaling was two things. It wasn't quite the extinction of whales as we think. Is what they discovered in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. right. Petroleum, oil. Okay? And that killed the whaling industry more than the lack of whales. Um, so, 1822, 60 American whalers visited Hawaii, but the Portuguese were already there. There were two people. How they got there, nobody knows, but they were building a ship for the King of Hawaii before Hawaii was united as a country. So, you get this interesting thing. While the Azorians were very involved in the whaling industry, you get something that we probably, well, I'll let you read. <laughs> okay. Now, the author, I, I got this from... Um, a book by Donald Warren. Donald Warren is a UC Berkeley, and he's done extensive research. And he's not Portuguese, but he just has done a lot of research. And there's a book titled So Ends This Day, The Portuguese Whaling, uh, in Whaling. And he attributes this not so much to the ethnicity, but to re the religious feelings of the time. The Azorians were Catholic. The Americans at that time were very Protestant. And the two never met. And if you wanted to get this owned, marry across those lines, you know. So now here's a completely different view. And again, I'll let you read. Okay, and the, the thing that's important is down here. This became very well established. You think of the trade winds in the North Atlantic. They run clockwise. So they would leave New England and head out because that's where the winds and the currents took them. Then they would get to the Azores. They would take on supplies. And they literally would leave port knowing they didn't have a full complement crew because they knew they could pick up people. It was illegal to immigrate from the Azores in those days. But literally, when the ship was spotted out at night, they'd hop on the boat, young men, and they'd get out. Because this, there was opportunity. And so they could earn a living, where in the Azores, it was very difficult to earn a living. So uh, Flores Island, the westernmost island of the Azores. Now, when the boats eventually, the ships eventually came back to Massachusetts, again, another part of American history, Slater's Mill the first sign of industrialization in the United States, 1790. And as the, that first mill spread and to other parts of New England, all of a sudden those that came ashore, if they didn't like staying out in the boats and if they wanted to settle down and get a family, they had ready employment because New England needed hands to work in the textile mills. And so people started to do that. This actually for me is very personal because my grandfather and my, well, should go back one more generation, my great-grandfather brought his family to East Taunton, Massachusetts in the early 1900s. And my grandfather, I always grew up with the story that he was 
13 years old and the family lied, said he was 16, so he could go work in a textile mill. Mm -hmm. And so I have a cousin who likes to do genealogy, and a few years ago he found the street and the address, and I went to East Town and found the street where he lived. I could not find number 21. There's no house number 21 anymore. So either they renumbered or the house burned down, but across the river was a textile mill, still to this day, although it's no longer a mill, it's now been converted into apartments, but the, the tall brick building is there where they worked in textiles. You know? And I have a great grandmother that's buried in one of the, I found the cemetery in East Townton, but the church records burned down. It's a Catholic cemetery, and so we no longer know what, know what grave plot. And I, it was a, one of those nor'eastern days, and I realized I never want to live in the East Coast. Uh, it was so bitter cold, <coughs> and I thought my ears were going to fall off, you know. And I, so I couldn't go gravestone to gravestone trying to see if she was there. So now then, you've got people settling, no longer just being on the boats, but now settling and working. And here you see the reference to the Cape Verdeans and to the people from Madeira. But again, it's a lot of people from the islands and only a small number from uh, the mainland. And then the interesting thing is, if you're going to have families and multiply, the females were all from the Azores. Okay? And so you start to have you know, settling, settling in the East Coast. But how did we get to California? Well, here's the interesting thing. 1880, this is the number of ships that went out whale hunting from New Bedford. These are the numbers from San Francisco. Okay? Dominant in it. But what had happened by this time? They were literally running out of whales in the Atlantic. They had hunted them so efficiently. It's one thing we Americans do. Whatever we do, we do efficiently. <laughs> okay? We had hunted them so efficiently that they were literally running out of whales. It was no longer economical to do. So where was the new source of whales? <coughs> out here, the Pacific Ocean. <coughs> and so it's shifted in a, in a five-year span, completely re reversed itself, now they're sailing out of San Francisco in huge numbers and almost disappearing in the Atlantic Ocean. And not only were they sailing, because this only refers to the number of ships that went out to whale hunting, but all along the coast, and we'll talk about here in a minute, they were setting up whaling stations. I did, I tried to look to see if there had been one here and it didn't seem like Mendocino had a whaling station. Humboldt had two. Humboldt, yeah. Up north, the Crescent in, City and the... Uh, landing in Trinidad. Okay, exactly. So, yes. So, but then you've got the discovery of petroleum and the whaling industry is going down, although it was not just, from what I understand, a lot of that with whale products were used in cosmetics. So, Even in women's bras, I think, used whale bone. Okay? Corsets. Corsets and those things. So there was a lot of different uses. Um, so again, I'm not going to read use of it. Just quickly let you read. Just a question about the whalers coming to California. Did they come prior to the 1880s? Did yes. they make it? They yeah, the, there's actually, if you look at the shore whaling stations, and, and I think I have a slide here, they were in the 1850s. Okay, good. I mean, it's basically, even before <coughs> the gold rush, I think they were sure. setting up whaling stations. But I think there's a lot of other factors that come in here. Uh, you know, the railroad makes it easy to ship yeah. and one all of, our, of those things. Yeah, one of our Portuguese immigrants who was here before the logging and all that uh, was said to have come via the whaling ship to get to the New World. Okay. So yeah. most of the um, Portuguese that came here, or Azorians, didn't come through the regular um, immigration process. They came on the ships. Uh, originally. Now remember, once they established themselves on shore, now they're bringing families. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you get the more standard immigration. But also something to understand, modern immigration, you don't leave 
well, there's obviously there's illegal immigration, but the legal immigration, you don't come until you have documents from the U.S. consulate that give you permission to enter the country. Uh, in the 18 and early 1900s, you got on a ship and you came. You didn't yeah. have to have documents. Yeah. Okay? My paternal grandfather uh, was a young man, went on our island. He went across the island. We lived on the north end of the island. And the south end was the, the biggest city in the Azores at that time. He went there to collect some money from some cattle that they had sold. There was a ship headed to America there in the harbor. And he told his brother, take the money back to mom and dad. Tell them I'm going to America. And he hopped on the boat and went to America. Went to Los Banos, California. Okay? Uh, and so in those days, when the ship was in the harbor, they wanted to sell seats. They wanted to make money. They wanted a full ship. They would recruit people to jump in. People got in. When they got to Ellis Island, and it wasn't just Ellis Island, it was Angel Island in San Francisco. There were ports of entry where they didn't decide whether they would admit you or not, but most people were admitted. Rarely was anyone turned around. So we've got, um, you know, an interesting thing here, too, that Portuguese became the language on the whaling ships. Okay? At one point, it was prohibited, but then it's like, how can you prohibit it when everyone from the captain on down <laughs> is Portuguese, and that's the, the language that they're using. So we talk about, sure, 1855, Sacramento Daily Union newspaper, uh, talked about Monterey, and again, whale, uh, whale hunting, and we're talking about the kinds of whales and all that, and I don't know how much $438 was in 1855, but I suspect that was a pretty good amount of money to earn in, uh, in a few months' time. And you can see that that's the kind of news that gets back to the Azores and says, oh, there is opportunity here, folks. Let's get out there. And this is actually a, a, a drawing or a picture from the, t from the one at Moss Landing you know, of the time of, oops, did I go too far? Yes, I did. Okay, um, so again, just uh, what, and a kind of a, a typical story here of immigration. 1862, uh, the station moved to Point Lobos. If you've been to Monterey, you know uh, kind of where Point, you know where it's at. <laughs> beautiful place. If you ever, I mean, well, you, why, why would you want to go there? You're here, you have beautiful <laughs> places here. Uh, but we like to hike around Point Lobos. And, uh, and again, just kind of a description of where people were and how they lived and things like that. So uh, very much a presence. Now you can see, here's what you were talking about, okay? Uh, this came out of actually a website that I found uh, from the state of California. There were a lot of shore whaling stations. And they, this was not by no means exclusively Portuguese. But very common to have Portuguese, so much so that one in St. Peter was even called Portuguese Bend. Okay? So very <coughs> much a reason how we ended up here. And, and so you see, again, an evolution where going from the poor boy on the boat to actually buying out the whaling company and it becomes the name New Company of Portuguese Whalers. Okay? Uh, I think, though, where Portuguese went wrong and continue to go wrong is we never had the, the venture capitalists. Okay? The ones who, are, who invest the money are the ones that always make the most money. Okay? We were always the good worker, the one you could rely on. We were never the smart banker who could bankroll the whole thing. And, uh, and so that always left us a little bit in, uh, you know, in behind the scenes in some of this. So the thing is, we know whaling ended and had to come to an end, and it came. And so what happened was, even though people came and started, and the whaling was the impetus to get people here, you know that around here, eventually people settled and started working in the, in the sawmills and doing that kind of thing. But here north, you see that very much. 
in our part of the, the world, dairying is where the Portuguese went into next. So if you go to Gastine, it wasn't whales, it was cows. So much so that 48% of all dairies in California are owned by people of Portuguese ancestry. 48%. The other 48% are owned by Dutch, interestingly <laughs> enough. And the other little smattering is a smattering of this, that, and the other. You know, but two ethnic groups dominate the dairy industry. And so where we live, we all got our starts in the dairy industry. I came settled in a dairy, and fed calves, washed barns, did all that before going to school in the morning, and came home and did that again. Albertina's father actually started his own dairy, and so she grew up feeding calves because the whole family worked on the dairy. And there are incredible stories of people who immigrated in the 1960s, and in fact, this one is not in the dairy industry. This is another area that they've come to dominate in the Central Valley, sweet potato production. Okay? All the sweet potatoes bought at uh, Whole Foods, at Costco, are produced by A.V. Thomas in Livingston, California. Okay? <coughs> he is the, the one who supplies them with their sweet potatoes. Huge business. The second largest employer in all of Merced County is A.V. Thomas Produce, somebody who came from the, from the island of Pico in 1970-something. <coughs> okay? Uh, so we, I think, came at a time, particularly where we, we live, uh, if you know the San Joaquin Valley desert, right? Until the Central Valley Project came in, the dams, the water, uh, Los Banos, in fact, uh, Gustine Los Banos has a St. Louis Reservoir where they take water from the delta, store it, pump it up into the reservoir, and then all summer long let it trickle out so we can flow south to L.A. and San Diego, literally, and the, and the valley. But the Portuguese were moving inland from the fishing and those things at a time when the water projects were in place and they could farm the Central Valley and they settled all over from Central Valley and in agriculture. But predominantly dairy, and I have been told, and I'm not sure how valid, but I think there's some truth to it. Albertina is from the island, her family, the island of St. George. St. George is a very steep, very high island, not very good for agriculture. The only thing it's good for is pasture land, okay? And so they're known for their cheese. If you've had Portuguese cheese in California, you bought in California, it came from the island of St. George. That's all they, they, were, they knew how to do and knew how to do very well. And they're the ones that got started in the dairy industry. And once you let one in, the rest of them go. <laughs> okay? And we learned, we from the other islands learned from them, although dairy has historically been a big part of the Azores. And so, and then something that you know here, I uh, had the privilege, because Rex told me where it was, I walked down to the Crown Hall, okay? One of the things the Azorians do wherever they go is they start a feast for the Holy Spirit. That is a uniquely Azorian. They, they think in the Middle Ages it existed in mainland Portugal. It died away, but it continued to exist in the Azores. And if you go to Brazil, where the Azorians settled, they do Holy Ghost celebration. If you go to Hawaii, where the Azorians also settle, they do Holy Ghost celebration. In fact, Albertina and I were in Maui, I don't know how many years ago, a decade ago maybe now, and I had read that there was an, a church in Maui that was started by the Azorian immigrants called uh, Holy Ghost. What else would they call it, right? <laughs> um, so we went looking. We knew it was in high country, we, so we didn't, weren't quite sure where it was, but we went just took the road. I mean, there are not that many roads in Maui. Take the road to the high country, and sure enough, we come upon this church. Uh, octagonal, yes. very odd shape for a church, you know, an octagon. So we, we get out of the car, we go in, and we're hoping that it would be open, and sure enough, it was open. 
And if you know anything about Catholicism, is every church has the Stations of the Cross, right? The Stations of the Cross are all written in Portuguese, okay? They were written in Portuguese that is now considered archaic Portuguese. The spelling is no longer, because unlike English, most languages in the world update their spelling every hundred years or so to keep up with how people are pronouncing it. Well, we've updated a couple of times, and so the spelling was still very much 1800 spelling, but it was there, and in fact, they had to restore them because they're now, you know, an, a historic monument. These things are so old. They had been made in Europe, sent to Hawaii, so it probably took a year's time to get them there, and they still exist. So on our way out, we happened to run into some people on the family going on the way in. They're, they're rehearsing for some, I forget if it was a baptism or something. They were coming in. So we start to talk with them. Turns out they are of Azorian background. Now they're third, fourth generation already. Nobody speaks Portuguese. But uh, we start talking about them. And sure enough, next to the church is a hall. And he starts telling us about their celebration of the Holy Spirit that they do in that hall. But it's also interesting how things get acculturated because the way that they provide their meat, if you know the historical way of doing the Portuguese food for the Holy Ghost, and it seems to be the only time of the year we serve that food, it's beef broth with cabbage and potatoes and other things, although the potatoes seem to have disappeared mostly in California, although in the Azores it's definitely meat and potatoes. And then you put the broth over hard, crusty bread, slice the bread, put it over, put, and then serve the meat and everything else. Well, in Hawaii, they were now cooking the meat more luau style. They were wrapping it in the, in the tea leaf, the ti leaf, and cooking it and serving it. But they were still celebrating the Holy Ghost celebration in Maui, you know, over 100 years since people uh, had last gone to Hawaii because there's been no Portuguese immigration for Hawaii for a long time. So you've got things like um, a heritage museum now set up in San Jose and you've got a crop. If, you're, if you like fiction, there are quite extensive uh, number of Portuguese Americans, the most well known is Catherine Vaz, who are writing about this experience. But Frank Gaspar has a, is a kind of up and coming author and uh, they use this Portuguese American experience to, uh, to as the basis for their novels. And you know, not so here because there's been no new immigration in this area, but in the Central Valley, a lot of churches, uh, best known maybe <coughs> Five Wounds in San Jose because it's very, uh, very ornate. Uh, a lot of different things that you see, including, and I, this will offend some of you but the Portuguese brought bullfighting to California. Okay? It's supposed to be bloodless. Uh, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But I think sometimes the guys who get out there, because the Portuguese have one tradition of bullfighting, well, one and several that makes it different from Spain. In Portugal, they don't kill the bull. They never have. Okay? The bull goes off, ends up in the butcher shop, and uh, ends up as hamburger, but uh, nevertheless... They don't kill the bull in a bull ring. And then the other thing that we do is we fight a lot from horseback. And those bulls that are fought from horseback have their horns capped, so they won't <laughs> gore the bull. But then they have a tradition that's not in Spanish bullfighting, a group that's called the Fricados, which literally it's nine guys. They wait for the bull to charge them head on. The, the front guy has to grab, literally get the horns on either side of him, grab the, his arms around the neck, and they have to bring the bull to a standstill, okay? And don't let your child grow up to be a forcado, <laughs> was what we told my kids, because every one of those kid guys ends up with broken ribs and, <coughs> and broken noses and, uh, and a few other things. Um, and interestingly enough, right now we're seeing a resurgence in the number of places that are schools that are teaching Portuguese as a second language. I think in part because Brazil was such an up-and-coming country recently, but I suspect Brazil is always the country of the future and never the present, it seems. 
They uh, just when they get going, they find another way to derail their economic development. Uh, but anyway, we've got several high schools now, mostly in uh, San Jose through the Central Valley. And uh, Albertina next year in her elementary school, they're actually going to teach Portuguese. And she's going to do it for an hour a day um, as an add-on program. So this actually happens to be in Hilmar, where the half of the population is literally Portuguese. Hilmar is a small town, 5,000 people or so. Um, and we've had, you know, just to again show you how acculturation happens. You guys familiar with fava beans? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. They were, nobody knew fava beans until the, supposedly the, the Italians introduced them to Americans 10 years ago. But the Azorians have always been eating fava beans. It was food of the poor. Literally was. Okay. Uh, we grew up eating fava beans. It's a Mediterranean bean. Uh, and... Uh, so we have a family in Turlock, this gentleman here, Joe Fagundes, uh, who as a joke one day, somebody said, w what are you, you know, he was uh, meeting with some friends and having a little party. Somebody came up and said, what are you celebrating? And he jokingly said, I'm celebrating Fava Day. And it was a joke. Uh, but the, out of that joke was born an interesting idea. Turlock Fair, the fairgrounds for Stanislaus County, which is in Turlock, literally fills a huge pavilion with people on May 9th of every year and all the funds go for children with cancer. Okay? And they literally get hundreds of people to come and shell the fava beans and cook the fava beans and the, it's free to anyone who shows up in the Portuguese tradition but then they do auction and fundraiser and that's where they, they get you because that's what it is. And what I was telling you earlier in the Central Valley, we have three congressional districts that are all represented by Portuguese Americans. Okay? Uh, starting in Merced County, going south through Tulare County. And in the spirit of bipartisanship, there's one Democrat and two Republicans. Okay? So we kind of, at one point, we had two and two, although um, one of them stepped down and was not replaced by a Portuguese American. So I don't know if I should say that because I read you guys voted, all, all of you voted for Bernie Sanders. <laughs> yeah, so, huh? So that's what I, there was a sign in the door that says 62% of Mendocino County voted for Bernie Sanders. So, you know, so anyway, I uh, just want to give now opportunity for you guys to share maybe a little bit of your stories and a little bit of question and anything more and because uh, I'm done of, uh, as far as formal presentation. In the early days, it was in the boats around South America, okay, in the 1840s and 50s. But my, um, when my grandparents came in, my, my grandfather, who was in the textile mills in New England, uh, his father decided to take the whole family back to the Azores at the start of World War I. In fact, the story that my grandfather used to tell us was uh, when the U.S. entered World War I, he was of draft age. And they gave him the choice to go serve in the Portuguese army or serve in the American army. And his father decided to go back to the Azores, take the whole family with him. And my grandfather and his brother joined the Portuguese army. And it was probably a smart choice because Portugal never sends a lot of people out to war anyway. So he did his a year of service in the islands. When he got out of the service, he came back, but this time came to California. And they would take a boat to to uh, Boston because that was the kind of the closest point and then literally go cross country by train. Mm -hmm. I remember my mother telling us, my mother who was born in Gastine went to the Azores when she was seven years old. And so I remember her telling us stories of going through the Midwest and the train would stop, I guess, at Indian reservations and Indians coming up trying to sell the goods, for her it made quite an impression because she had never run into Indians in California, Gustine, California, but ran into them as they were going on this multi-day, I think it took them a week or longer to, uh, to go back to get to the East Coast by train. Yeah. Fascinating stories. Yeah. Did Elijah realize that there, there was, maybe there still is, a certain amount of bias toward Portuguese? I didn't know that. We were 
born in San Francisco, and I didn't know about it until I moved to Chico, <coughs> and uh, was told I worked in a store there, and somebody found out I was half Portuguese and informed me that there were people, if they knew, they would let me wait on them. And then I, I was just, you know, I can blew that off until yeah. I came here. And then in, in Rome Mendocino, an organization that was started in the early 1900s, of which I'm a member, if I had tried to join then, I wouldn't have been allowed to join because I was Portuguese. Yeah. You're in Mendocino. In Mendocino, exactly. <laughs> but also, there was Portuguese that were in um, um, Indonesia, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there was an island there where we... Timor. Were, yeah, and they said, you'll see how they how they, how they look, you know, Portuguese. It was very yeah. interesting. But I have no idea... There's an independent country in Indonesia now. Called East Timor, uh -huh. that was taken when the Portuguese pulled out in 1975. The Indonesians took over the, the island uh -huh. and tried to integrate it, and they kept fighting them off. And for some reason, Indonesia decided it wasn't worth the headache and gave them independence in 1990 thereabouts. You know, and so today they're, in fact, one of the, uh, one of the, their, their. Uh, their the bishop, actually, I think it was the bishop and somebody else, I'm trying to think of who the two, got the Nobel Peace Prize, you know, because they, they worked this out peacefully, although there was some uprising within those islands. There was, yes? Three, three little tidbits you might enjoy. Um, an ancestor in Mendocino named Herman Feo in an oral history said that there were 59 Azorean Portuguese families in Mendocino. Um, that many, which, which surprised me. I wanted to read you a very short bit, and I apologize for the language on this. Fred Diaz, this is an oral history interview okay. from a Portuguese, said, Grandfather sailed out over the Pacific Ocean. He was a whaler, a hunter. He believed in getting those whales. They were no good for anything anyway. Pretty soon, if you had too many of them around, the beaches would be full of whale shit. <laughs> <laughs> So I figured that person had, had some connection with the whaling industry. And we have a street here a couple of blocks away called Calpella Street. And in the, in the research here at the he Kelly House, there's stories about it being called the Street of the Seven Sisters. Because there were seven sisters from the Azorian Portuguese, from the Azores, yeah. that all married into the community, all lived on the same block, and they said the kids would just sort of run around in clouds from house to house. Yeah. But it was the street of the seven sisters with seven yeah. Azorian But it, it, it's interesting because going back to what you were saying, when I was talking to Rex yesterday, he was telling me the reason the Azorians were down there is because it was the plan nobody wanted. It was too foggy and too windy. Have a hand here, then we'll go back there. Okay, yes. Uh, along the same lines, uh, uh, I had an uncle that graduated from UC Berkeley in the late 30s, and he applied to uh, UC Graduate School and was denied admission because he was bluntly told he was, he was Portuguese. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you know, but at Fort Bragg, every year they have a Holy Ghost celebration. And they do uh, have the parade, and then they have with all the girls, and then they have the soup with the bread. And soup. It's pretty good. It's still, yeah, it's, most of these organizations are now 100 years old, and they're still going. Although, I, I, as I, I, I told Steve yesterday, I think uh, the Crown Hall could use a donor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because it's going to be, it's a pity to see something that's yeah. so old, yeah. you yeah. know, disappear. Mm -hmm. Going back to the slides that had the different counties and the populations, I think it was the top 12 mm -hmm. were shown. Do you know where Mendocino would have fallen on that? No, because uh, you know, you, when you're talking about number of people, you have a, a county that's not heavily populated. Right. So you, know, you end up, I mean, when you're talking San Leandro and, right. and the Oakland and those areas, you know, a heavily urbanized area. There's it's only 80,000 in this county. Is there 80? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, you know, that's not a whole lot. In terms of the family names, are names like Fial and Flores common on the islands? Yeah. Hey, well, those, those are both names, names of two islands. No, it's, that's why I'm asking, because yeah. here those are names. Yeah. Did, did people take a first name and then the name of the island they're it's, from? It, a lot or of is that the family no. name back there? It's, um, it's funny because in, the, in Portugal, a lot of names are named after last names are named after trees, 
Carvalho, for example, is oak. You know, I noticed you had. To, I, we went, I went to walk the cemetery yesterday. I, I think you learn so much from yes. walking cemeteries, you know. And I and when you saw the name Fe, Feal, uh, we saw that some other names. But there's a either or names where you're from. You know, mm -hmm. Borba is not a common name here, but Borba is a town in Portugal. And we have a lot of friends where, and a lot of people where we live that are named Borbas. So we, because in literally in Portuguese, when you say Portuguese names, we drop we tend to drop them here. But I'm Elmano Martins da. D-A, and then Costa, C-O-S-T-A. Mm -hmm. Costa literally means coast. So I'm El Mano from the coast. Yeah. Okay? It's like all the Dutch are Van something, you know? Uh, again, it's kind of the same thing. You know, historically, people didn't have last names. Last names are a fairly recent invention. And in fact, this is an interesting thing in the Azores, is people have formal last names, but nobody knows them by their formal last name. <laughs> They are <coughs> basically known by nicknames. So you're, you're, tall, you're John the Tall, or you're John the Sun, or in some cases with vocabulary like your story, you know, uh, that you don't want to repeat in polite society, but you know, they, they pick up these nicknames because they're John the Stutter, right. or, uh, or John the Blonde, or, or Mary the Skinny, or something like that, you know, and that's how people kind of knew each other. Yeah. But uh, how about, uh, Aria? Yes, yeah. very common one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so very, very much. We yeah. really enjoyed your talk. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you for having me. I, I, I'm sure that all of us, when we uh, either hit Costco or Whole Foods or maybe even the Harvest Market, when we look at those yams and sweet yeah. potatoes, <laughs> we'll think, oh, yeah. it's been They don't thing. label them from where they come, though, uh, so you won't know. No, well, then it would have to be all foods at Costco. Yeah. But lovingly raised by a Portuguese. Yeah. With Mexican laborers. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, Kelly House appreciates all of you coming, and we will have a, another Sunday afternoon uh, talk on the 26th of June, and that will be about um, Asian and Chinese immigrants uh, by uh, Lorraine P. Chortley. And uh, if you are not a member of Kelly House, we hope you will consider joining. Uh, you get a wonderful discount coming to these uh, afternoon lectures. And you also receive the Historic Review publication once a year. And also are invited to other special functions throughout, throughout the year. But uh, thank you very, very much. And again, my pleasure. really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed coming here. Thank you.